Good morning, good morning, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Princeton Lyman. I'm a senior advisor to Nancy Lindborg, the president of the Institute of Peace, and welcome to this uh, to the Institute. Uh, let me just say a word about the U.S. Institute of Peace, in case you're not familiar with it. It's an independent government agency created, I should know, but a good 20, 30 years ago, uh, and dedicated to the cause of the uh, prevention or containment of, of a conflict and that peace is possible. Um, the Institute has programs uh, in almost all parts of the world, in Africa, the Middle East, in Asia, and has a major training program through our academy that trains people around the world in conflict prevention. So welcome, welcome. And now let me welcome you also to this conference, Atrocity Prevention in the 20. First century, yes, I have, a, I, it, looked, for, it looked like a three, and I thought you would be very far ahead, but no, the twice it is. And let me uh, have a special thanks to our co-host, the Embassy of the Embassy of Switzerland, and the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Um, so, so uh, Switzerland currently serves as the chair of the alliance, so we're pleased to have their support today. Um, let me again give a plug about the U.S. Institute of Peace because we have a long-standing program in this area, uh, most note, note, noteworthy. Excuse me. I, um, didn't have enough coffee or water this morning. Um, well, it's no, noteworthy there was our involvement in the Genocide Prevention Task Force, an initiative in partnership with the American Academy of Diplomacy and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which is represented here today. The task force, you may recall, was co-chaired by the uh, former Secretary uh, Madeleine Albright and Bill Cohen, and its report remains one of the most Imp impactful policy blueprints the Institute has ever produced. Our engagement in this field has become more geographically oriented, as I mentioned. Over the years, we are now engaged in Myanmar, Central Africa Republic, and Sudan, just to name a few of the locations where we are doing this kind of work. Now, I'm going to make some more remarks if I go off. Uh, what is it? Go off uh, uh, message, uh, Jonas. You'll pr uh, allow me because I'm glad that uh, in the way we've set up this conference that we are not going back to never again. Uh, I say that because there will be agains again. Uh, none of the issues that have been raised in the Middle East in the Arab Spring have been resolved. Extremists are raising uh, tensions in a country like uh, Bangladesh uh, that has a history of extreme violence. In Africa, there are many potential areas of new atrocities, even as we have ongoing ones in South Sudan and parts of the DRC. So it's good to emphasize prevention. Uh, because the more we prevent, obviously, uh, the greater uh, we have achieved our, our effort. But I think we have to look at the fact that we have not been able, as an international community, to prevent Yemen or, or uh, South Sudan or uh, other ongoing tragedies. And what we have to realize is that in those situations, the politics uh, overrides all the commitments that, that nations, have, nations have made to, uh, to prevention. And indeed, I think, and I, as you go forward in this conference, we have to look not just at the prevention causes, 
But I would challenge you to look at how political forces override those efforts. And whether we can understand enough about the potential of political forces, that we can develop counters to that, that we would understand the politics of the next round of atrocities and have some counter to that other than calling on the genocide prevention and all of that. Otherwise, I fear our voices will be voices in the wilderness and they will not be heard. Now, I didn't mean to start on such a dystopian uh, comment, but uh, I think that's a factor we must focus on. Now, let me please uh, turn to someone who uh, will not be so dystopian and to introduce the ambassador of Switzerland, uh, Ambassador Tahiden, uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much and welcome again to everybody. Good morning, Ambassador Lyman, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here among you at the U.S. Institute uh, for Peace, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the third panel uh, discussion in the context of the current Swiss chairmanship of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The topic of today's panel is Preventing Atrocities in the 21st Century, Seven Decades After the Holocaust, How Can the World Prevent Atrocities? One is tempted to rephrase the question in the title, how much have we really learned since the Holocaust, if anything? Unfortunately, war crimes against humanity, genocide, and ethnic cleansing have not stopped with the Holocaust, despite the many efforts, despite the many uh, scrutiny we have given uh, to, to, this, uh, dark, uh, uh, to this dark part of our history. So the question is how, uh, of how we can prevent future atrocities um, and this will be very much in the center of today's panel. Genocide prevention is a key task for the international community. The 2000 Stockholm Declaration, to which all member states of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance adhere, underlines this commitment. And I quote from there, with humanity still scared by genocide, ethnic cleansing, racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia, the international community shares a solemn responsibility to fight those evils." End of quote. Switzerland is actively involved in efforts to prevent atrocities. This includes early identification of potential causes and their elimination in the long term. Switzerland works with the United Nations in preventing atrocities. Switzerland has also been, for example, a driving force behind the establishment of the International Network uh, Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes. And I have also to add that uh, throughout my diplomatic career, the topic has played a role for instance, when we had the OSC chairmanship at the end or towards uh, the end of uh, the Bosnia war, or when I was uh, very much involved uh, with our humanitarian rescue efforts during uh, the, the war in Kosovo, or then later on before this posting, when I was the head of the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, where we dealt a lot. This, this this is the equivalent of USAID, where we dealt a lot with uh, war-torn uh, so, uh, societies. And in all those contexts, it is very re 
real, and it is something, to some extent, you only learn to understand if you speak to people, uh, to people uh, who were victims, and this is something throughout my life I found important, to deal with victims, but also to look ahead that no people become victims anymore. It's perhaps something we will never reach, but it's an effort we should, uh, we should do. I would like to thank the U.S. Institute for Peace for co-organizing and hosting this event. It is always uh, good to be here in this wonderful and important institution. And so let me thank the moderator, Jonas Klaas, and Donis Montes for their support and the three outstanding panelists for having agreed to join us this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, test, okay. My name is Jonas Klaas. I'm a senior program officer here at the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'll be the uh, facilitator of this discussion uh, today. I also wanted to share my gratitude to uh, Ambassador Dahinden and his team from the uh, uh, Embassy of Switzerland uh, for co-hosting this event, uh, as well as the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. I think beyond highlighting the importance of atrocity prevention as a, a policy uh, priority, um, a few days after International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I think this gathering serves two additional uh, objectives. First, at this point of time, with a relatively new UN Secretary General in place and also a relatively new US administration, it's important to take stock and of the progress that's been made so far, and also to look further back by evaluating the norms, institutions, and policies that have been put in place over the past few decades on atrocity prevention and to see how much progress uh, has been made. We were very pleased to see that the current U.S. administration has decided to continue its engagements with the atrocities prevention boards and that U.N. Secretary General uh, Gutierrez has emphasized conflict prevention as one of his priorities, even though he has been a little bit less outspoken on uh, atrocity prevention. I think secondly, this is also a good opportunity uh, to look ahead with uh, our panelists uh, today and identify some of the ways in which we could make our efforts more effective in this field. Uh, do we need new institutions? Do we need new policies or instruments um, or instruments for field engagements? So in the next uh, hour and a half, more or less, we hope to reflect on the effectiveness of prevention mechanisms and our ability to measure success in this peace building uh, field. The uh, event is uh, streamed online and will be able to be retrieved afterwards uh, on our, our YouTube uh, channel. And you can also uh, follow the uh, conversation online during the events uh, using hashtag SwissIHRA series. At this point, I would like to uh, introduce the panelists uh, of today. I'll provide very brief uh, introductions because their bios are available at uh, the entrance. Uh, starting with Lawrence Wucher, uh, who is a research director at the Simon Schiot Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and also my former boss here at USIP. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Mo Bleeker is a special envoy for uh, dealing with the past and the prevention of atrocities at the Swiss Federal Department of uh, Foreign Affairs. And finally, uh, Professor Menachem Rosensaft, uh, who serves as the General Counsel of the World Jewish uh, Congress. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, Lawrence, let me start with you. Um, at the uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and previously at, at the USAID and, and USIP, you've made important contributions in helping us conceptualize uh, the field of atrocity prevention and also in trying to help us identify the best institutional fit for, for this policy domain. So I, I hope that in, in, in your comments you can also help us clarify what atrocity prevention looks like uh, in practice and, and, and maybe offer some thoughts on, on what, worlds, what works best. Or yours. 
thank you very much, Jonas, uh, and thanks again to the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Swiss government for convening this conversation. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, was founded as a living memorial to the Holocaust, and preventing genocide has always been part of the mandate uh, of the institution uh, for almost 25 years now. That work is now carried out through the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide through our uh, program of research, education, and public outreach. Um, so uh, given the, the title of today's conversation, I thought actually we're almost one-fifth of the way through the 21st century, uh, and it's actually not too early to, to try and take stock on where we are and, and how the first uh, 18 or almost 18 years now have gone uh, and where things might be headed in the next uh, several. Uh, so it got me thinking if we had had this conversation uh, 10 years ago uh, and asked the same set of questions, I think there would have been uh, quite a lot of cause for optimism in thinking about preventing mass atrocities. Uh, at that point, say in, in 2008, um, the prevalence of mass killing events was at the lowest point in 60 years. Uh, we were at a point where there had been five consecutive years with no new onsets of state-led mass killing, according to the data that we track. At the same time, there was a sense of momentum on the normative and political uh, side, uh, particularly through the 2005 adoption of the responsibility to protect at the UN World Summit uh, um, of that year. Uh, and then there were repeated references to the responsibility to protect uh, by the UN uh, Security Council and the General Assembly. In the United States, a little closer to home, we were at, I think, uh, nearly the apex of the grassroots mobilization that um, occurred um, based on the, the tragedy in Darfur, in Sudan. Uh, so many people were, uh, uh, were, were mobilized, were, were calling their members of Congress, were speaking out, were rallying on the National Mall, um, saying that the United States government should be a leader and be heavily engaged in the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. And later that year, the Genocide Prevention Task Force, which has already been mentioned, would, would add a uh, high-level bipartisan stamp uh, behind the prioritization of preventing genocide and mass atrocities and issue this blueprint for how the U.S. government ought to go about pursuing uh, those tasks. Now, I think, uh, unfortunately, today, if we have an honest assessment, we have to be a lot less sanguine. Um, First, the, there's been a, a notable uptick in the incidence and prevalence of uh, mass atrocities and mass killings, uh, and um, a number of these have been actually extremely large-scale events, uh, especially Syria stands out uh, among the rest, but also South Sudan, Burma, there are a number that are really of quite a shocking scale um, in the last uh, few years. Politically, there's been, a, I think, a notable um, series of challenges and setbacks to the what had appeared to be a steady progress in uh, affirming the responsibility to protect. Um, a lot of this is, is pinned to the aftermath of the Libya intervention, um, but also we have to look at the, the complete lack of um, success of collective action on Syria as um, really a, a, a damning uh, piece of evidence for the political um, consensus on preventing uh, and responding to atrocities. In the United States, I think the story is a little more complicated and maybe uh, too early to tell. Uh, as Jonas noted, there are signs of, of continuity with the, the Trump administration continuing to convene the Atrocities Prevention Board, which was an innovation of the Obama administration, and many, if not most, thought would, would, uh, would go away uh, with the transition, which is quite typical, even when they're not, um, uh, you know, a change in parties or uh, a, a sharp change in perspectives. Uh, we see, again, the uh, genocide and mass atrocities being referenced in the national security strategy, as it has been for, for many uh, times in the past. Um, but I think more broadly in the United States, we see uh, a, a, a more serious debate about the basic questions of how we define our interests and responsibilities around the world. Uh, and that debate is unresolved and will continue, um, I think, for the next many, many years. And we don't really know uh, how it will end up. So I think um, this should give us significant cause for uh, a sober discussion. Um, 
And if we try to make some informed speculation about the future, I think there's uh, some additional reasons for concern. Um, I'll just highlight uh, three factors that I think suggest that in the coming years, the risk of mass atrocities around the globe is likely to, uh, to increase. Um, and first is the, the increase in great power competition. Uh, and this especially has a profound effect on the effectiveness of the UN Security Council, which is, as we all know, the, the principal venue for um, addressing threats to international peace and security, including atrocity crises. Uh, when the UN Security Council is, is blocked, as it has been on Syria, uh, it makes an effective collective response much, much more difficult. But on top of that, increased great power competition could lead to an increase in, in proxy wars, uh, and that uh, raises risks of mass atrocities because we know that atrocities occur uh, quite frequently in the context of, of civil wars, especially those where there, uh, there's external intervention on one side or the other, or both. The second point is really around the normative development, uh, where I think there's reason to be concerned that the um, not only the norms around the responsibility to protect, but more broadly, the, the uh, post-Cold War, excuse me, post-World War II uh, international human rights uh, norms are increasingly going to be called into question uh, for their relevance, for their effectiveness. Uh, we have an elaborate uh, system of norms on paper, um, and we have a fairly involved um, institutional architecture to uh, report and monitor the uh, compliance with those norms uh, and, and laws. But um, I think as we see uh, some countries um, just shirk their responsibilities with, with very little attempt to even cover up or make uh, excuses, uh, people will continue to uh, increasingly call into question this whole uh, normative architecture. And then th the third uh, point that gives me great concern looking forward about atrocity risk is the strains on the uh, international humanitarian and peacekeeping systems. Um, these are, are two uh, core elements of the international response to crises uh, of a variety of kinds, but including uh, crises where mass atrocities are committed or threatened. Uh, and they're both under serious strain now uh, and will be in the future. Uh, the humanitarian system is challenged by the increasing volume of demands, but also by the complexity of those situations where humanitarian actors are, are thrust into. Uh, there are uh, continuing uh, shortfalls in funding uh, and um, situations where uh, the traditional humanitarian uh, principles are fundamentally challenged by the changing nature of the, the conflicts and violence around the world. Peacekeeping uh, has been an effective way of responding to uh, civil wars and fragile agreements that have ended internal conflicts, uh, including many which have involved atrocities. Um, peacekeeping operations now routinely have uh, protection of civilian mandates in, in incorporated into them, uh, but we have a strain on the capacity of peacekeeping, both at the field level and at headquarters. Uh, we have a situation, as in South Sudan, which um, on the one hand, you, you had a peacekeeping operation on the ground, and yet you had uh, atrocities being committed um, despite that. Um, now, you could say there's a partial success in as much as the peace, peacekeeping operation opened the gates to the, the sites and allowed uh, many civilians to flee there and, and uh, find some protection. But more fundamentally, I think it raises the, uh, the question of is there a even more profound uh, tragedy in a peacekeeping operation to come that would really call into question the entire enterprise? So um, to me, those are some, some reasons to be um, concerned. Now, that concern shouldn't leave it, lead us to complacency, but to renew our efforts and redouble our, our energies. So just finally, a couple of words about uh, what atrocity prevention can look like in this evolving uh, and ever more complicated uh, context. Uh, my main uh, message here, I think, is to beware of, of reifying this notion of atrocity prevention. Atrocity prevention is not a, uh, a particular process or a, uh, a particular set of tools. It's a goal. 
It's a goal of preventing large-scale and systematic attacks on civilian populations, preventing genocide, uh, systematic war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's going to look very different in different contexts. It's not exclusively the work of states or international organizations. Um, it's certainly not ex exclusively or even principally, in many cases, the work of outsiders. So we need to think about it in, a, in that sense that it is a, a goal that we uh, work towards uh, in highly tailored ways, depending on the context. Um, and therefore, I think uh, one implication is uh, the renewed energy around uh, the prevention agenda uh, at the UN through the UN Secretary General uh, and the Security Council in some recent resolutions. Um, even where that's discussed in fairly vague or expansive terms and not specifically connected to mass atrocities, to me, I think that's an important opportunity for the atrocity prevention community to seize on that prevention agenda, even in its expansive fashion. Um, so I see no contradiction in a, uh, the unique perspective, morally, legally, uh, analytically, that comes from focusing on preventing uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, uh, and large-scale war crimes, and a strategy to try and achieve those goals that involves trying to build bridges to these other areas. Uh, that involves uh, expanding beyond the uh, community of people who define themselves as uh, pursuing uh, the prevention of atrocities. And in fact, I think actually reaching out and trying to uh, collaborate with those broader communities, be they peace building, conflict prevention, transitional justice, uh, countering state fragility or, or the like, uh, actually may be the, the most effective way of uh, reaching the road to uh, preventing atrocities. Thank you, Lawrence, for those helpful uh, observations. Next, we'll turn it to one of our guests from, from Switzerland, uh, Ms. Mo Bleeker. Welcome to Washington. Uh, a few years ago, we held uh, an event here as well that looked at opportunities for, for transatlantic cooperation on, on atrocity prevention. Uh, so in a way, your participation here today uh, offers a very good follow-up uh, to, to that activity. Uh, we'd certainly be interested in, in learning from you what, what the priorities of Swiss government uh, look like uh, in this field and perhaps what, what you see as some opportunities for transatlantic uh, engagement in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here, actually. Um, and uh, also in such honorable company. I, in particular, have been working also with Lawrence Butcher years ago. And I do believe it's good to be in community and to think together. Uh, we think here together because we are worried. Uh, but we're also working, and uh, in this complex time, I use I use as a kind of reflex to come back to basics. And um, I would like to, to question a little bit together and with you some some vocabulary we are using in order to think about what we do and how we could do it better um, um, in, in the future. So indeed, I have a strange title. I'm Special Envoy for Dealing with the Past and for Preventing Atrocities. So it's both uh, geared toward the past, but in order to prevent recurrence, and geared toward the future in order to better also assess how to honor the victims also and in particular with at the core of that prevent any recurrence or prevent any atrocities to happen in the future. So we have been, we are talking about atrocities. Um, some argue that there are no legal, legally binding uh, definition of, of atrocities. Um, let's simply accept that uh, we understand atrocity crimes as comprising genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. Um, what genocide crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing have in common is the fact that they refer to systematic and widespread acts of violence against populations that may occur either in times of conflict but, but also in times of peace, and that's important to remember. Uh, war crimes, on the other hand, can only be committed during armed conflict, but they do, necessar they do not necessarily imply an extensive scale. I think these, um, these elements are important, 
And in the context of atrocity prevention, the war crimes that are of concern are those that impact on the protection of human life and that are considered to be committed as part of a large-scale plan or attack against populations. So we know that the types of potential atrocities and contexts in which atrocities may be committed vary greatly from one situation uh, or the other. That in turn tells us that no size fits all and that we have to adapt any strategy of prevention and I will talk to that uh, after. Um, the world atrocity crimes is also used by the issued in 2014 United Nations Framework of Analysis of, for Atrocity Crimes by the Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and the Responsibility to Protect. So it has acquired somehow in this last decade a kind of droit de cité uh, as it is now. Uh, as I was saying, some people oppose the term atrocity crime, stating that it's not legally defined. Uh, but, and to come back to what Lawrence was saying before, and away from any legal debate that we might have another day, allow me to underline that the more systematic use of the term atrocity crimes has allowed in the last decade to open a very important space for joint cooperation above the lines of division or above the lines of non-cooperation between different communities involved in genocide prevention, involved in responsibility to protect, involved in protection of civilians or in international justice or in transitional justice, to name only these few. Um, it has helped us somehow to overcome the silo uh, practice and politics uh, in each of our little uh, field. And this cooperation in turn has allowed important and positive steps, both conceptual and practical, to happen in this last decade. And I think we pretty much uh, join together on that. So let me now continue, and I'm sorry to be so basic, but uh, sometimes it helps to come back to, to basic. What do we mean by prevention? Prevention entails, uh, uh, sorry, do you hear me still? Yes, okay. We can, what falls on the ground can't fall <laughs> further. <laughs> uh, prevention consists in a series of measures of, or initiatives that shall be taken to avoid any accident to happen, any situation to worsen, or any contagious negative dynamic to further develop. Prevention is normally realized through limiting the risk with specific measures aiming to suppress or considerably reduce the probability for such negative or dangerous events to take place or to reoccur. It also uh, has to do with strengthening the societal resilience to developing capacity and predictability, namely the strengthening of capacities to early identify such dangers, to, di to design timely pertinent risk reduction measures, and to implement them, protecting in particular the weakest actors and group in society. And when already in risk, protecting in particular the weakest actors, uh, limiting the exposure, sorry, to such risk and events and the gravity of their consequences. So we talk a lot about prevention, and even if we consider that it's uh, excellent and very important that the UN Secretary General has somehow uh, taken this on board again with him, um, we might ask ourselves, and we were talking about that in the little room before, are we really preventing uh, when we consider what the words preventing uh, means? Actually, prevention should happen before, um, before these terrible events happen, but the reality is what we too often call prevention happens in reality often when the house is already burning. That is when it's too late. Uh, in many contexts, it's clear that mediation, diplomacy, cooperation, international or transitional justice somehow have contributed to prevent a further degradation of the situation. But let's face it, when faced with the soon to happen or ongoing atrocities during these last decades, the 
the united international community, to use the expression of Yehuda Bauer, in particular the Security Council, has not been able to prevent neither Rwanda, neither uh, the atrocities in the Balkans, Libya, Yemen, Syria, and or to avoid the Rohingya tragedy uh, to speak about a uh, very recent event. Indeed, I am afraid that we do not have many successful experiences of prevention to showcase. And I have to say that while Switzerland has decided years ago that prevention of atrocities shall be high on the agenda, it has given me the possibility during 10 years, actually, uh, to work on this subject matter. And in this context, I have witnessed, indeed, many failures and some successful small steps, important enough to be named. And this led me to my first conclusion that if we really wish to effectively prevent atrocities, namely using these terms, we would need a real change of paradigm. And if you allow me, I would like to share some of this basic element of what this uh, shift of paradigm shall mean. First, I believe that prevention to be effective shall be understood as a permanent endeavor. It's now uh, called upon when tragedy is already ongoing. Uh, so a permanent endeavor that shall be enshrined in national policy, agenda, budget, and institutional architecture. The very same that public health systems have prevention enshrined in their continuous and permanent policy. For this to happen, of course, there is a need of a common understanding of what needs to be prevented, how to prevent it, and who enforces prevention. In turn, this kind of conversation and discussion, debate, and consensus building could also become a unique opportunity to generate not only consensus, but reinforce the fundamental values uh, around which we would gather uh, around this subject. Let me give you an example. The excellent Ambassador Mula Mula from Tanzania, who has been a key figure of the International Conference of the Great Lake Region, notably its memorandum for the prevention of genocide, has been insisting on the fact that this memorandum of understanding signed by 12 states in this region has allowed them to pass, and I quote her, from non-interference to non indifference. Sounds small, but it's hugely different. So this passing from non-interference to non-indifference has led to a series of initiatives to be taken. National committees have been created that communicate with other national committees. A series of indicators and measures have been decided upon that are shared uh, in the regions through these 12 countries. And when it goes wrong, and we know it goes wrong uh, in some of these contexts, diplomatic channels are open based on this voluntary uh, commitment to talk, to express worries, to pressure, to correct, to help and support before condemning. In other words, this permanence of the structure and this decision to be engaged on a permanent basis offers room of maneuver and allows the diversification of means, of means used to mitigate the risk. Uh, another element is prevention to become effective needs to be domesticated. Uh, local actors shall be sitting in the driving seat. Domestic policies in architecture shall be history, culture sensitive and aimed to strengthening the resilient capacities of this society. Furthermore, and it's evident, solutions are multi-sectorial. So therefore, cooperation between state and civil society at all levels lies at the core of the successful prevention. The domestication of prevention is a key to this success. And in turn, again, it can also become the opportunity for a new international cooperation agenda, bottom up. Um, that leads to my third point. Prevention is by nature an agenda of cooperation and not an agenda of imposition. Um, in this globalized world, as we said, and Lawrence underlined it very well, threats are interconnected and no society is immune. So while prevention is being domesticated and nationally based, it needs a framework of cooperation to be fully effective globally. 
It implies, again, a long-term permanent cooperation agenda based on fundamental consensus about, again, what needs to be prevented. Who are the legitimate actors to do so? And what are the credible, meaningful, and legitimate means to prevent? Developing, again, a consensus about this extremely challenging, but again, it can become an extraordinary opportunity for the community of nations. And another way to say it would be, could we turn the issue of prevention in a positive uh, agenda? The fourth point would be, the prevention in action can indeed contribute to strengths and democratic values. Prevention policy and architecture to be effective shall entail, and we know about that, early understanding of what is at stake, early agreement on indicators related to the past that leads to atrocities, early decisions, and early actions, and early cooperation at all levels. Said in other words, prevention strategies shall aim to empower societies to manage conflict constructively and politically, to increase resilience, to enhance social, political, and economic inclusion, and to provide safety and security for all. In this context, for example, part of early elements of prevention of atrocity is the prevention of discrimination on particular grounds, race, religion, belief, sexual orientation, the prevention of incitements or hate speech at a very early stage, the prevention of revisionism, of course. These are issues about which it's of particular importance to generate consensus in each of our societies and not only in the other society or in the societies of others. On another note, in the aftermath of a conflict, the prevention of the recurrence foresees the strengthening of national institutions acting according to rule of law, and this is central. These institutions are again key to any democratic system. What I want to say here is that prevention as a permanent endeavor goes hand by hand with the strengthening and deepening of democracy. And in that sense, it can be seen and it should be handled, I think, more and more as a constructive agenda. Uh, and my last element for this um, shift of paradigm would be the regional agendas for prevention of atrocities are key to address the issue in complementarity with the UN. Whether prevention action is taken in the realm of the conflict, violence, disaster, or pandemics, an effective response always begins with an analysis of risk followed by upstream structural or systemic action. This can be done well only in advance of a potential crisis emerging through, for example, strengthening institutions or addressing exclusion. In that framework, national and international capacity can and shall be built incrementally, while ongoing permanent structural and systemic prevention can be implemented in relation to rising or immediate risk through early warning and early action. So the multiplication of domestic architecture and mechanism shall be completed by regional and international cooperation. Um, Prevention, in that sense, can only be effective when complementarity is in action. A national architecture, regional cooperation can and will lead in turn to a better cooperation with and hopefully within the UN. These are, for me, a little bit the five preliminary elements of this paradigm ship, uh, shift, and I hope we can discuss about it later. And to end, I would like to um, share with you about the creation of the Global Alliance Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, GAMAC, with a platform of prevention. This is uh, very much inspired, I would say, uh, by this paradigm shift, a community of commitment that actually Switzerland is sharing. And this platform, created in 2013, is a joint effort with Argentina, Costa Rica, 
Denmark, Switzerland, and Tanzania, uh, with the support of the Genocide Advisory Network, GPNET, the Global Center for R2P, the International Coalition for R2P, the Francois Xavier Bagneau Center for Health and Human Rights at Howard University, and the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, several high level personalities, and of course, the office of Adam Adiang and Simonovic are from the UN. Uh, is strongly associated to this initiative. GAMAC is, uh, and that's my answer to your question about transatlantic cooperation, GAMAC is a global, inclusive, state-led voluntary network of partners that support, are interested in, or are involved in atrocity prevention. We have chosen to have a very low threshold of um, entrance in this community, whoever and whoever state is interested in uh, or involved in atrocity prevention can enter and can begin cooperating uh, with us. It intends to support state that wish to develop national architecture for the prevention of atrocity crimes in collaboration with other atrocity prevention initiatives, networks, and actors. So again, it's in complementarity with other processes that are ongoing. GAMAC provides an open and global uh, platform. Uh, we meet every two years. We have an extensive um, uh, networking uh, capacity and the possibility to provide expertise and exchange from the south to the north and now to the change. Um, for as an example, Switzerland will have to make its own homework, namely will begin to design its own uh, national strategy for prevention of atrocity. And I'm sure that in this case it will be helped by the countries who already have this kind of structure uh, among them, some of them coming from the International Great Lake Conference region, namely Tanzania uh, and other countries will help us uh, doing so. For Switzerland, and I will close with this, our commitment uh, around the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and uh, our commitment in the creation of GAMA goes hand by hand. By dealing with the past, we seek to honor the victims and contribute to prevent the recurrence of such atrocities. And by, in turn, engaging in the creation of an initiative such as GAMAC and the design of our own architecture of prevention of atrocity, we honor the victims of past atrocities. We recognize that no state is immune, and we seek to prevent forthcoming crises. Um, in atrocities. In a nutshell, I understand GAMAC as a community of commitment that tries to already implement this paradigm shift and therefore engage in the creation of national permanent architecture and policy supported by regional cooperation and in turn trying to influence the multilateral agenda in the UN. In May 2018, GAMAC will convene its third global meeting open to any state and organization who wish to engage in this cooperative effort with a view to generate uh, this global architecture. I can only invite you to check under www.gamac.org and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Bleeker, for those observations. Um, finally, we go to Professor Rosensoft, a special uh, welcome to you as well. I think your participation will allow us to go back to the foundations of this field in some regard as you teach on the law of genocide and war crimes trials. Look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I do it from a standing? Does anybody mind or uh, prefer? Perhaps I think because right, we'll be okay. double mic'd. All right. If you don't mind. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, honored to be here, Ambassador Lyman, Ambassador Dahindian, uh, my friend uh, Dr. Geisbühler, um, and Mr. Klaas. I'm honored to be here. Um, as uh, you mentioned, it's a bit daunting to speak as the third speaker on a panel on which 
much, if not all, that can be said about prevention has pretty much been said. And so, with your permission, I'd like to, as uh, mentioned, go back in time a little bit in terms of how we got here. Uh, precisely 72 years ago today, on January 30th, 1946, Charles Dubois, the deputy chief prosecutor for the French Republic before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, read into the record a document dated February 14th, 1944, from Hermann Goering to Heinrich, Heinrich Himmler, that read in relevant part, and I'm quoting, Dear Himmler, I ask you to keep at my disposal for Air Force armament the greatest possible number of KZ cut set prisoners. The initials KZ, as we know, stood for Konzentrationslager, that means concentration camp. Uh, I continue quoting. Experience has so far shown that this labor can be put to very good use. The situation of the war in the air necessity the situation of the war in the air necessitates the transfer of this industry to underground workshops. In such workshops, work and housing can be particularly well combined for cut set prisoners." End quote. Dubot went on to explain that the facilities to which Goering referred included the Dora Mittelbau tunnels or caverns dug into the Harz Mountains some five kilometers from the city of Nordhausen in southern Germany where the V-2 rockets were being manufactured. Uh, the previous day, on January 29th, Alfred Balashovsky, the head of the laboratory at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, had told the tribunal what Dora had been like when he had arrived there in February of 1944, where what he called ace social criminals who had been put in charge by the SS, quote, beat us from morning till night, we got up at four o'clock in the morning and had to be ready within five minutes in the underground dormitories where we were crammed, without ventilation and foul air, in blocks about as large as this room into which 3,000 to 3,500 internees were crowded. There were five tiers of bunks with rotting straw mattresses. Fresh ones were never issued. We were given five minutes in which to get up, for we went to bed completely dressed. We were hardly able to get any sleep, for there was a continuous coming and going. Furthermore, it was impossible to sleep because we were covered with lice. The whole Dora camp swarmed with vermin. It was virtually impossible to get rid of the lice. In five minutes, we had to be in line in the tunnel and march to a given place. Referring to the goering himmler communication on January 30th, 1946, Dubot told the tribunal, and again I quote, we know then who was responsible for the frightful condition which the deportees of Dora had to endure. The person responsible, that is Goering, is in the dock, end quote. I happen to have a personal interest in Balashovsky's testimony in the Goering to Himmler communication. My father arrived at Dora on February 11th, 1945, and was a prisoner there until early April when he was taken to Bergen-Belsen less than two weeks before liberation. He came to Dora wearing a uniform with a special red circle, the so-called Fluchtpunkt, identifying him as an SKP, after more than six months of torture in the notorious Block 11 at Auschwitz, and a brief two-month respite at the Langensalzer concentration camp. My father used to say that Dora was even worse in Auschwitz. Why is any of this relevant today? Because 73 years ago, there was little reason to believe that those responsible for Auschwitz, Dora, and Bergen-Belsen, for Treblinka, Majdanek, Sobibor, and all the other sites where millions of Jews were murdered as part of the Hitlerite final solution of the Jewish question, would ever be brought to justice. Certainly, there was no precedent for holding a Hermann Goering or a Hans Frank or an Albert Speer accountable for acts many of them atrocities perpetrated within the governmental framework of the Third Reich. We have come a long way in the 72 and a half years since the end of World War II. From the vantage point of 2018, we have not only the International Military Tribunal and its charter in our re rear view mirror, but also the subsequent American Nuremberg trials, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, 
the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court. Still, it behooves us to bear in mind that international criminal human rights law is in its jurisprudential infancy. The recent genocide convention of Ratko Mladic by the ICTY served to remind us that less than a quarter century ago, government officials still sought that they could and would get away with brutal mass killings of civilians based on their national, religious, racial, or ethnic identity. Let us be perfectly clear. On January 27, 1945, when Auschwitz was liberated, and on May 8, 1945, VE Day, when World War II in Europe came to an end, there was no basis in accepted international law for prosecuting the perpetrators of what we now call the Holocaust. Nor was there a forum where they could be brought to justice. As things stood on those two dates, arbitrary vengeance, vigilante style or otherwise, or reliance on domestic courts were the conventional alternative for not allowing the murderers of European Jewry to get away with it, as it were. Moreover, the Nazi leadership in Berlin, as well as the concentration camp personnel on the ground, still had available to them, at least in theory, three affirmative defenses. One, what they did was legal under the laws of the Third Reich or as promulgated in the countries occupied by Nazi Germany. Two, they could claim immunity as government officials. And three, they were obeying and complying with the orders of their superiors. By August 8, 1945, when representatives of the United States, the United Kingdom, the USSR, and France formally approved the charter for the IMT, international criminal law was dramatically and, as it turned out, permanently transformed. A mechanism, albeit a short-lived temporary one, was established for bringing Nazi war criminals to justice. A brand new cause of action for cr crimes against humanity was created with a provision of the charter applying retroactively. Government leaders and officials would not enjoy immunity for their actions, and the defense of superior orders was barred. All of which begs a central question. What took the international community so long to confront egregious mass atrocities, which we all know have occurred long before the 20th century? The destruction of Carthage by the Romans at the end of the Third Punic War in the second century before the Common Era, and the slaughter of tens of thousands of Khazars of Languedoc in southern France during the Albigensian Crusade of the 13th century are but two examples of historical crimes against humanity. In August of 1209, the abbot Ardour Almaric reported to Pope Innocent III that in the city of Béziers, quote, our men spared no one, irrespective of rank, sex, or age, and put to the sword almost 20,000 people." End quote. This falls four square into the category of what we today call genocide. Fast forward to the 19th century. Uh, fast forward to the 19th century forcible relocation of more than 16,000 Native American from the southeastern part of the U.S. to western territories on brutal forced marches that resulted in the deaths of between 3,000 and 6,000 members of the Cherokee Nation, a harbinger of the way in which between 600,000, the most conservative estimate, and a million and a half Armenians would be murdered by Ottoman troops between 1915 and 1918. What changed in 1945? I suggest that it was in large measure the vast scope and multinational, transnational nature of the Holocaust that caused the transformation in our collective international mindset that led to the watershed IMT, followed closely thereafter by the Genocide Convention. Unlike previous mass atrocities where the victims were localized, the Jewish victims of the final solution came from all across Nazi-occupied Europe and vast numbers were transported across national borders to the death camps the Germans had set up in Poland. To put the issue in somewhat different context, 
the stakeholders in the search for justice during and in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust were not confined to a single country. The Soviet Union, France, Hungary, Belgium, and the Netherlands were only five among many founding members of the United Nations that had a deep personal interest in not allowing the Nazis' mass atrocities to go unpunished. And there were Jewish organizations, the World Jewish Congress foremost among them, that kept a sim similar pressure on the government of the US and Great Britain. All of which lead us to our central question today. What, if anything, have we learned in the past three quarters of a century? In Article I of the Genocide Convention, the contracting parties undertake to prevent and to punish genocide. After Nuremberg, it is implicit that the same approach should, at least in theory, hold true for crimes against humanity generally. The reality is that the international community has done an adequate, if not spectacular, job in the area of punishment. Even though the perpetrators of genocide and crimes against humanity in Darfur, Syria, Iraq, and in all likelihood Myanmar are unlikely to sit in the dock of any tribunal anytime soon. Still, the World War II war crimes trials in Europe as well as in the Far East, the Eichmann trials, the ICTY and ICTR, Cambodia Khmer Rouge trials, and other tribunals have resulted in the conviction of substantial numbers of war criminals on these charges. When it comes to prevention, however, and here I am very much in agreement with Ambassador Lyman, the same international community has in large measure failed to step up to the plate. The very fact that genocide and crimes against humanity were allowed to occur in Bosnia, Rwanda, and so many other places speaks for itself. There are, of course, multiple reasons for this. Still, we are far from being able to congratulate ourselves on our progress in the area of genocide or mass atrocities prevention. I thank you. Thank you all. I think the interesting part of this panel so far has been that all of our speakers approach this topic from a very different angle, but all uh, hone in on, on the central question of, of this panel. Now, before we go to questions from the audience, um, I would like to spend a few minutes with, with, with one question I wanted to raise to, to our panelists, perhaps for some from brief initial uh, insights, and, and it relates with the topic of, of, of effectiveness and impact. I think both uh, Ambassador Lyman and, and Professor Rosensoft, they pointed out that we both have ongoing mass violence and quite likely there will be future atrocities uh, taking place. I think Lawrence uh, also pointed out that atrocity prevention should be seen as a goal that progress could be uh, made towards. And Ms. Bleeker uh, emphasized the critical element of, of early prevention and upstream uh, prevention uh, within this field. So I would like to, to ask uh, our panelists of how do we assess progress towards this goal of, of atrocity prevention? What, what does success look like in this field? Is it the end of, of all mass violence? Is it a reduction of, of new onsets of, of, of mass killings? Or is it a reduction of risk before the eruption of, of, of this violence? Some initial thoughts uh, on, on, on that would be helpful, just from where you sit, from within your organizations, uh, your institutions, or how the uh, international community uh, can make progress towards that goal uh, more general. So um, some initial thoughts, perhaps, uh, starting with Lawrence. Sure, I think, <clears throat> I, I guess I would say that we should think about it in two, two different ways. One. The goal should and has to be ultimately uh, the amount of mass atrocities and mass violence that goes on in the world. That should be our our north star that we're uh, working toward to eliminate this kind of uh, violence from the world. Um, now we should do that with a great deal of humility about our ability to actually get there. Um, and part of that process should be trying to learn about incremental uh, successes and progress, which means that when we engage in some particular effort, uh, be it developmental, diplomatic, humanitarian, or, or otherwise, uh, that it's incumbent on those of us doing that to articulate the, the theory
theory by which we uh, imagine that intervention will have some positive impact and ultimately reduce the risk of atrocities and then try to, uh, even with all the complications and difficulties, measure the, uh, the impacts and effects of those actions. Um, so I think it's by both the keeping our eyes on that, that long-term ultimate goal and being very uh, sort of near-term and, and uh, humble in our efforts and tracking and monitoring that we might be able to make some progress. Um, a little bit in the same line, I would say that uh, one of the problems with prevention is that if you are successful, you don't see anything <laughs> because it should not happen. So that's that's a very difficult uh, issue, and uh, you know I think it's it's easy, it's helpful to take the analogy with public health. Mm? Uh, actually, uh, one of, in order to prevent atrocities to happen, you need to make all kinds of different things that at first uh, stage you think have nothing to do with prevention, right? So uh, it's all about strengthening rule of law, it's all about strengthening, you were speaking about politics and political communities. This is central to this issue. Um, so I, I think that the challenge is uh, the invisibility of successful prevention. And now when we speak about what does success look like, it looks like this hetero heterogeneity of different efforts in different fields that contribute to strengths and institutions, that contributes to strengths and rule of law, that contributes to anchor and strengthen uh, the deepest values that are at core of democratic systems. And uh, so these are, I would say, the steps that finally help us to push further down the line uh, the danger of entering in a period that could, or uh, in, in situations that could lead us towards atrocities, right? So that's a little bit the paradox of the situation, I think. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be somewhat less optimistic. And uh, let's refer back for a few minutes to Einstein's uh, famous comment that the def definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Let's take a look at where we have been since 1945. We knew in 1993 of the atrocities that were being perpetrated in Bosnia. Not only did we know it, but uh, Elie Wiesel famously turned to President Clinton at the opening of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in April of 19, 1993 and said, Mr. President, I cannot not tell you something. We must do something. The result, of course, was that in Srebrenica and elsewhere, we did nothing. Worse. In Srebrenica, which had been set up as a safe haven, the United Nations troops walked away and turned over the Bosniaks to the Republika Srpska Sugs. We knew what was going to happen in Rwanda. We knew what was going to happen in Darfur and did nothing. There were warnings, and we talked, and nothing. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum had a genocide conclusion regarding the Yazidis in Iraq. Nothing. The, we knew in advance and know now what is happening to the Rohingya. Nothing. So let's at least be honest with ourselves. We have not been successful for whatever reasons in preventing mass atrocities. We are, we have done very well in recognizing them. We have done very well in making sure that people know that these are international crimes under international law. That's all well and good. But I will tell you that from the perspective of the individuals receiving the unwanted attentions 
It is very little comfort to know that there are people sitting in New York or London or Bern who basically say, oh yes, it's terrible, they're victims of genocide. This is what happened during World War II, this is what happened during the Armenian genocide. So let's understand that we don't have a mechanism in place, we need one, but so far we have not figured out how to do it. Thank you for those uh, observations. I would like to invite the audience right now uh, for, for questions and that we'll post to, to our panelists. Uh, there are, my colleagues are in the back of the room, so feel free to, to raise your hands and uh, I will uh, um, um, draw them to your attention. Professor Regenbogen, we have one question there on the right. I'll take three questions at a time, if that's uh, feasible. Uh, and then we'll take uh, the lady over there in the, the green uh, sweater. Please go ahead. Mr. Professor Regenbogen, or who has the microphone? Okay, let's start over there. Hi, good morning. I want to thank all of you for sharing your insights with us today. My name is Victoria Ernst and I'm a second year law student at American University and a research associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group. My question is for any of you that would like to respond. Um, the International Law Commission is working on a draft convention for crimes against humanity. Um, war crimes and genocide conventions already exist and as all of you have pointed out these crimes continue to be committed. So what kind of an impact do you think a convention on crimes against humanity will have on preventing atrocity crimes? Thank you. We'll Can go you next to uh, the lady over here. Hi, good morning. Um, you have all discussed prevention before atrocities begin and so my question is, how would you suggest the international uh, community finds a balance between respecting uh, independent sovereignty of nations and preventing atrocities before they begin? Okay, and we'll take one more question over there uh, in the middle. Good morning. I um, am moved by the discussion and ask the question, how in this community, in the Beltway of Washington, we sell humanity within the context of national security. And as you've shown, there are future issues that involve the entire world in terms of how they can be threatened, from migration to diseases. The question, what I don't understand, maybe you can enlighten, is why isn't there enough activity by the organizations to convince the United States as the architect of this international organization, world order, to pivotally commit that trade and human rights be integrated as a part of the national security interests of not only this country, but all countries, so that this indifference can become more a part of our cumulative agenda instead of the idea of this is an intervention of humanitarian services. We'll take some more questions after initial uh, round of responses. Perhaps we can start with you, uh, Professor. Well, I'd like to address the first question because it's something that I'm, of Ms. Ernst, because I'm, it's an, it's an important question. Uh, I'm not sure that we are in a po international political climate in which a convention on crimes against humanity is likely to get approved and adopted. I just don't think it's going to happen. I also think and in retrospect, in 1945, 1946, there was some debate as to what was going to come out of the United Nations. If you look at the 1990, uh, 1946, I'm sorry, and if you look at the 1946 resolutions that set about the process for the uh, Genocide Convention, the resolution before it was the resolution on the Nuremberg Principles. And but for uh, Raphael Lemkin uh, pushing for a genocide convention, 
I think the atmospherics in 46, 1947, 48 were such that at that point we could have gotten a convention criminalizing crimes against humanity basically as defined at Nuremberg, and that would have included genocide, which probably would have left us better off because we now have this rather false premise that genocide is a crime of crimes, and therefore if you murdered uh, hundreds of thousands of people for a different reason other than that set set forth in the Genocide Convention, you are somehow less guilty, which of course is an idiocy. But to get back, it's not so much that I think we're going to get a convention on the crimes against humanity. It's rather that I think we need to sensitize the international community that crimes against humanity as defined, and they're in the Rome Char- uh, Statute for the ICC, they're in the uh, ICTY and ICTR charters, are every bit as heinous as uh, genocide, and let's move on. But in that context, I think that's where we find ourselves. We'll work our way back, Ms. Bleeker. Yes, I remember what Lawrence said at the very beginning uh, about the, the threat that are in front of us. Um, I would say not to repeat, but you have been saying that um, one of the paradox of developing norms and standards is that we end up with a series of norms and standards which are not implemented. And I find this actually in the field um, uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, It can even become dangerous sometimes because the less you implement these norms and standards, you are somehow contributing or one one is contributing to lowering uh, their importance and their credibility and legitimacy. This is why I would be very prudent uh, to go to develop new norms and standards as long as we have such difficulties to implement them. That would be a very basic criteria of mine. Um, and, and then allow me to, to react to what you were saying. I think we are not here saying either we are optimistic or pessimistic. I think we have to be and we ought to be extremely realistic and take somehow the legacy of all what you have said before, all what we see happening now, and say nevertheless, and in spite of all this and with with all that, what can be done today? And how can we look at that in a longer framework? We have not been talking here about the immense efforts of mediation, of diplomatic back channeling, etc., where uh, we could, I could give a series of examples of actually tragedies that has been avoided. One of them, for example, is a very famous case of Pando uh, in Uruguay, where a massacre had been taken place, and the community of UNASUR, uh, the Latin American countries, had decided at this stage to send very quickly an investigation commission, uh, and that led. Uh, to basically the stop of uh, forthcoming coup d'etat uh, with all the massacres that could have been taking place uh, after. That's, for example, in the Latin American community, an example of uh, their capacity to intervene to prevent genocide that they are often uh, quoting. I think these are important examples. Huh? We were talking, what, what does success look like? I would say this is one of the success in the past, but it's often not talked about in the terms of we prevented a big genocide along the road, right? Uh, But we could, and I think this is one of the tasks we should develop in the prevention field, is communicate about many steps that are being done that are strengthening the capacity of our society because values are more and more enshrined uh, and they are now in danger, human rights is in danger. Uh, So this is where we ought to put attention because we might um, considerably uh, weaken the whole 
possible architecture for prevention to become effective uh, when we need to act. Uh, last but not least, I would like to say that it's evident for me that human rights, uh, rule of law, transitional justice, and all these elements are core uh, in, the, in the field of prevention, um, but also um, education. Uh, also um, uh, history teaching, also the capacity and initiative to develop tolerance and uh, constructive management of diversity, and you may name it. These are all for me an, a, a kind of uh, inventory of what we would need somehow to inscribe in uh, the to be done in the field of prevention. And last but not least, uh, what I was talking about, um, announcing this elementary uh, elements of a paradigm shift, is evident. It is a celebration of prevention as the reaffirmation of sovereignty in all its dimension. And this is why uh, we have been talking about prevention when we were uh, speaking of military interventions. And there, I kind of join what you are saying. We have not been able to prevent. We have been able sometimes to make military interventions. But let's be clear. Military interventions are not what we can call, in general matters, uh, prevention at the first range, right? So prevention. Uh, shall uh, become uh, domesticated, as I was saying before, that's absolutely crucial in order to have ownership and to be able to develop program. Therefore, in turn, this is a solemn affirmation of um, sovereignty. Uh, to whom was asking this question. And I think that uh, responsibility to protect is one proof of it even more. Just uh, <clears throat> one or two comments on this question about the relationship between atrocity prevention and national interests and how we think about that. Um, I would point you back to the Genocide Prevention Task Force from 2008, which tries to make this case and argues that preventing genocide mass atrocities does promote uh, U.S. national interests uh, because of the spillover effects and um, second order consequences and, and so forth. <clears throat> and I think there's a reasonable case to be made there. I guess I would just add Let's not um, try to force everything onto the national security argument, because there may well be circumstances in which um, the uh, targeting, large-scale targeting of civilians in some remote place which does not have any inherent uh, interest to in the United States, which may be self-contained, uh, still is something that ought to cause us as a country, as a government, uh, as an international um, community, serious concern. So we shouldn't be shy about making the case that this matters in and of itself, even as we highlight those uh, congruences with more traditional uh, conceptions of national interests. Let's take uh, another round of questions. I had a uh, lady here on the third row, and then we have uh, gentleman Will Ferjaro on the fourth row. Hi, thank you all very much. It was very informative. Um, I, I have a question in terms of what I'm hearing is that the approach is basically reactive. And um, I think what's missing is maybe the proactive piece. Um, in other words, there are probably building blocks and certain environments that could be triggers or could be, you know, come to our attention that these may be areas of potential atrocities and maybe start at the rudimentary level rather than waiting until the atrocity is full blown. I think Mr. Rosencheft explained, you know, this in, in his talk and then reacting to there's an atrocity and what can we do to now mediate or help the situation once it has already occurred. So um, I'm asking, like, I, I sit on the Jewish Community Relations Council Holocaust Commission in Maryland, and this year the um, topic of our community commemoration is hate speech and the way it affected the Holocaust. And we're trying to, you know, say how can we take the lessons of the past, just like you were saying, and apply them to the future, um, look around us in a global environment, and where do we see hate speech, and how can we get involved in an early stage? So I'm wondering in the institutions that you recommend, um, what is being done in a proactive level to teach these type of things and get involved in areas of the world that have the type of conflict that could lead to atrocities early on? 
Thank you. Bill, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'd like to the, the panel to come back to Ambassador Lyman's first challenge about uh, all of you have spoken to a certain degree about an architecture uh, of prevention, uh, regional, uh, inter intergovernmental, uh, within the U.S. government and, and historical reference points. But I'm wondering, uh, what is the architecture for, for the political decision making? Because in, in, in effect, uh, uh, budgets at a minimum when you're talking about prevention budgets or if you're talking about reaction and response to ongoing atrocities, the political calculus is, is what's necessary. So I wondered if, if each of you could address that. Um, I know in part that a lot of this work has, has uh, at, the, at the regional level and the inter, intergovernmental level has occurred because of the lack of, 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 of political uh, action at the top levels, and that's to be commended. And, 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 uh, but, but I'm wondering if you could address that both at the UN, uh, the permanent five uh, po political level, at the regional level, and uh, within, your, uh, within respective countries, uh, what is the p political calculus and what is being done uh, to affect that? Thank you. Thank you. And then we have one final question all the way in the back row. Thank you. I am Italian, old uh, baby boomer, so my question is linking with the gentleman uh, about Auschwitz, what the word knew. We know now that the Pope and Mussolini knew about Auschwitz few hours after the start of the assassination of the Jews, few hours. So without the internet, without Twitter and Facebook, the world already was able. So my question is about politics, because if you don't touch this issue, you don't solve the problem, because we had Italians, 700 war criminals, least from Yugoslavia, Ethiopia, and other countries. No one of the Italian accused of war crimes was given a trial in Yugoslavia, in Ethiopia, or at least in Italy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we have uh, questions for all three of the panelists uh, in this last round, and we'll probably conclude after this uh, some final thoughts and answers, starting with Lawrence, perhaps. Yeah, um, I guess let me try and speak to the last latter two questions on politics. Um, I mean, I, I don't think there's a simple answer. Uh, and I guess in a certain way, it's a generic question about whatever your issue is, how do you pursue a political um, a political agenda to raise that issue up the priority list and to um, to try and promote action in particular cases. Uh, and so I, I mean I don't have any um, any sort of uh, new ideas there. I think it's about grassroots mobilization. It's about grass tops mobilization. It's about looking for key influencers, um, you know, voices who who have influence with key people within governments. Um, and, uh, and then seizing on specific opportunities of cases where people are already paying attention, may have other motivations to, to be engaged and be interested, and, uh, and then bring in the broader atrocity prevention agenda alongside it. So um, I, mean, I guess that's, there, there's uh, work to be done on building that political program, whatever it looks like. Uh, our work at the Holocaust Museum is, I think, um, Partly, we, we pursue this by trying to raise attention to ongoing mass atrocity situations and may, just make sure that Ameri the American people as a whole, and especially our leaders, uh, are aware of these, of these situations and the human toll that it takes on people. So make sure we're telling the individual story so it doesn't get lost in the, in the din of things. Um, but there were, at the same time, and this sort of speaks a little bit to the first question, we're at the same time trying to spotlight the early warning signs in other cases, uh, which are, are countries or situations that are not in, in the front pages. But we can say, uh, based on our analysis of past uh, situations, 
this country bears some of the signs to be worried about. It's not yet in a full-fledged crisis, but now is the time to invest some level of energy uh, and take some actions that might uh, mitigate those risks. So that's, um, I think, the kind of approach that, that we take, though. I, it's an ongoing process, for sure. Ms. Bleeker? Yes, to, to be very concrete, um, um, I think that, um, you know, 20 years ago, um, I don't know how many National Human Rights Commission, for example, were existing, right? So that has been a long process uh, in order to win these spaces and somehow to mainstream human rights policy uh, within national agenda. Huh? So actually, I see in a very basic manner uh, this national domestic architecture before the regional ones to be created in a very analogic manner. Um, and don't forget, always, I think that for us thinking in how the engineering the public health system and its preventing uh, methodology and mandates is also an interesting manner to look at it. So first of all, very basically, I do believe that uh, you need laws for that. You need law for prevention. So this is uh, how you do get to these laws is the fruit of uh, social mobilization, is the fruit of intensive discussions between civil society and the parliament, politicians, etc. So that's very important. You need a, you need a, a vision of an architecture, and a prevention is something extremely concrete that you can deconstruct in a series of things to be done and programs to be uh, to be executed. And you need, therefore, to have a, a multiplicity of institution involved um, that uh, has to do with school, violence from violence at school, discrimination at school. You also need all the institutions who are involved in uh, uh, rule and order uh, or security in, in another context. You need religious actors to come, to come by. And you need then, once you have all these actors together with a mandate, um, to talk about what are the indicators that in your society you knowledge as being possible indicators of a spiral towards a negative spiral and a negative incremental uh, possibility. And what are the laws uh, that you can use in, you know, regarding hate speech, for example, incitement, to be able to use them on time uh, and with the support of still functioning uh, institutions. So uh, concretely, I think it goes in, in these directions. And I think it would be interesting for you uh, to look at the functioning of the National uh, Committee of Prevention of Genocide, for example, or atrocities already existing, for example, in some of these uh, 12 uh, countries uh, that I was quoting before in the International Conference of Great Lake Region. I do believe they have a lot uh, to teach us. Um, about politics, I, I would completely follow what uh, Lawrence is saying, I think this um, mixed mobilization uh, between civil society and its capacity also to produce research and to suggest ways and avenues to go ahead needs uh, is, is absolutely crucial. And it needs, of course, to get in touch with uh, parliamentarians and politicians who in turn have to propose a uh, legal framework. Uh, this is, by the way, what we will need to do, uh, Mr. Ambassador, in Switzerland, but we are already beginning to set up. Uh, and one of the first efforts that we are realizing now, for example, is discussing with parliamentarians what is the roadmap going to be in order to get in one, two, or three years uh, to the approbation of a national strategy uh, at our level. And I'm sure that during this conversation and during this um, journey, um, the majority of our discussion will turn around how to preserve, actually, the what we could call the democratic capital and value we have in our society. And this, I find, um, actually, as I was saying before, I find that in turn, this is a wonderful opportunity for our society to re-strengthen and to regather uh, around these values, basically, and this and this capital. Mm -hmm. Well, as a uh, as a totally non-political organization, 
the, uh, the World Jewish Congress, I will not endeavor to touch the political third rail in this particular conversation, but would like to suggest a slightly different issue. Uh, perhaps we ought to look at set our sights somewhere else, and not at the exclusion of other things we're doing, but rather as create a priority. At the World Jewish Congress over the past few years, we have been dealing at great lengths with cyber hate. With cyber hate, incitement to violence, incitement to killing, uh, anti-Semitism and xenophobia generally, as it is being spread on the internet in ongoing ways, and to figure out how to prevent that. And there, we have found that Facebook and Twitter are actually quite willing to be cooperative in helping. And we know that much of the atmospherics are created on the web. And for example, in Germany, even though it's illegal, you can find all kinds of neo-Nazi music that glorifies the killing of Jews and the killing of Muslims and the killing of Roma and the killing of gays. And it's illegal, but unless somebody pressures Google or YouTube to take it off, they're not going to be inclined to take the initiative. The same with other types of uh, hate speech. And I understand there's a problem with uh, dealing with hate speech and incitement to violence, or incitement to killing in the context of free speech. But we also know that incitement to genocide is a cause of action on the, in the international, con uh, in the genocide convention. And hate speech is something we can attack. And my guess is that if we were to eliminate it or at least lessen it and create an approach on that area, that in turn would end up dealing with what was said before, trying to get at the roots of it before it turns into a genocidal situation or a uh, ethnic cleansing situation. Because otherwise, we are allowing the Goebbels-like indoctrination to take place, except that Goebbels did it through newspapers and radio and we can only shudder to think what would have happened if he had had um, the internet available to him. So perhaps that's an area that we should raise on our uh, mutual agendas, because that's something we actually can attack. And where we have seen on our level alone that success not absolute, but a measured success, is in fact possible. I'd like to uh, thank the Embassy of Switzerland, in particular Ambassador Da Hinden, uh, Simon and Maud, uh, also my colleagues uh, Emmanuel Tonis for making this happen, as well as Ambassador Lyman. And please join me in thanking the panelists of today, uh, Lawrence Witcher, Ms. Pleeker and Mr. Rosensaft. Enjoy the rest of your day.